get something real clear. This defendant had an STD. And this defendant assumed that he got it from Brooklyn Sims. But ladies and gentlemen, this is not about an STD. Does that make it okay? Absolutely not. This is not about an STD. This is about his pride. The STD is curable. Brooklyn Sims murder is not. sultry afternoon of Friday, August 11th, 2023, the languid air in Pensacola, Florida was abruptly shattered by a cacophony of terror. A lone man embodying the essence of unforeseen malevolence brazenly strode into a bustling Home Depot, his intentions as obscure as they were sinister. In a moment that seemed to defy time, he unleashed a barrage of gunfire, transforming the mundane into the horrific in mere seconds. Amidst the aisles lined with tools and home essentials, one person was tragically slain, left lifeless in the wake of this inexplicable violence. The cruelty of the act was further compounded as two of the deceased women's colleagues were injured as a result of the assailant's fury. Yet, as the investigation unfolded in the aftermath, the depths of the tragedy deepened. They revealed a narrative steeped in depravity, a blatant contempt for the sanctity of human life that chilled even the most seasoned detectives to the bone. As we venture into this multifaceted and deeply disturbing case, we tread a path lined with questions of morality, sanity, and the very nature of evil itself. This is not merely a story of a crime, but a reflection of the darkest corners of the human psyche. Let's dive in. On Friday, August 11th, 2023, a worker at a Home Depot in Pensacola witnessed a disturbing incident. Well, um, I came back from a lunch break. I went behind the counter to go pick up my trusty iPad I use for surveying. And um, I was talking to a coworker and I heard pop, 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 like five or six rounds go off. And um, I realized it was a gun and I told him, I said, duck and cover. And I went right up underneath the counter, um, back behind the main counter, and I was sat there Indian style, and I called 911. Then I heard someone was hurt, and I said, also, please send paramedics. And I stayed with her on the line until um, the police arrived and uh, told us to evacuate. When Escambia County Sheriff's Office deputies arrived, they discovered a deceased woman lying face down in aisle 52. She was identified as 18-year-old Brooklyn Sims, a single mother with a two-year-old daughter who was working her usual shift. Two of Sims' colleagues were also shot. One was grazed in the hand and the other grazed in the back. Deputies were told by witnesses that the suspect left the building running. We do believe the victim was targeted, said Escambia County Sheriff Chip Simmons, and the other two were essentially in the wrong place at the wrong time. Surveillance footage captured a male entering the store and turning down aisle 52. Seconds later, people are seen running from aisle 52 while the shooting suspect runs back toward the entrance. He flees into the parking lot, enters a silver four-door sedan, and exits the parking lot at a high rate of speed toward Duval Street. Soon after the shooting, a man called the Pensacola Police Department from a nearby Mellow Mushroom restaurant on Bayou Boulevard. The caller went on to provide his location, and officers arrived quickly. Uh, 
on your knees, keep your arms out, put your arms on your head. The caller was identified as 20-year-old Keith Ag from Calvert, Alabama. He was taken into custody without incident. According to the arrest report, Ag was transported to the Escambia County Sheriff's Office and subjected to interrogation. According to police records, after waiving his Miranda rights, he told detectives that he and the victim, Brooklyn Sims, had been in an off-and-on relationship for the past four years and had one child in common. He said despite Sims having been granted a protective order against him, she would still have contact with him so that he would be able to see their child. A.G. claimed that they had spent the weekend together at his residence two weeks prior. They were intimate, and the rest of the weekend was without conflict. He then began to describe a possible motive for his actions. A.G. said he started his day by going to work at a steel company in Mount Vernon, Alabama. While at work, he received a call from a local medical office. He was given the news that he tested positive for the sexually transmitted disease gonorrhea. Upon hearing the results, he became angry, left work, and drove to his home nearby to collect his 9mm handgun. He then got back in his car and started driving from his house to the Home Depot in Pensacola to confront Sims at her workplace. He added that he pulled over when he reached Loxley, Alabama. He said he thought about whether to keep driving at that time. Ultimately, he chose to allow his pride to get in the way of his judgment and continued driving to Pensacola. A.G. explained to officers that Sims and his mother work at the same location. He stated that when he arrived at the store, he located her and asked to speak with her, but she said, oh, not this again, and turned her back on him. Her co-worker allegedly laughed at him, and that's when he drew his weapon and fired multiple rounds killing Sims and injuring two of her co-workers. A.G. stated he fled the store, returned to his car, and drove away from the scene. As he was driving, he tossed the firearm out of the car window. The weapon was later recovered by police. A.G. said he then drove to a movie theater parking lot and wandered in the woods through a creek before deciding to call 911 to turn himself in. A.G. was subsequently booked into the Escambia County Jail on charges of murder in the first degree, domestic violence, and two counts of aggravated battery with a deadly weapon. He was given no bond pending his first appearance. In typical criminal proceedings, a pretrial detention would signal a pause in the action as all parties await the trial for justice to unfold. Yet, in this peculiar and twisted story, such detention was not an end but merely the opening act setting the stage for a sordid and unexpected turn of events. Following Keith Agee's arrest, authorities confiscated his cell phone. A search warrant was swiftly obtained, paving the way for a forensic examination of the device. The data extracted from Agee's phone, even in its partial form, left the most hardened staff members in a state of disbelief. Recovered text messages exchanged between Keith A.G. and his mother, Sheila, began at 10.37 a.m. on the day of the murder until a mere 40 minutes before the shooting at Home Depot. Keith starts the text message thread two minutes after learning about the STD test results. He finds out his mother is working with Sims in Pensacola and expects to give her a ride home to Alabama after work to collect their daughter. His initial plan is to confront Sims as soon as they arrive. At 11.09 a.m., Keith texts, She ain't do nothing but cost me money and give me an I'm getting ready to shoot her. I know, I hate that for my daughter, but like I said, I can't take it no more. Sheila responds one minute later, stating, Okay, I'll call you and tell you, MF, if you want to go to jail. I'll tell you when we get close, but if you don't come kill her, you a Don't call Nanny and tell her. She'll try to talk you out of it. 
Keith replies, I ain't even going to tell her why I left. I'm just going to say I got to go to the dentist. To which Sheila replies, don't shoot at my MF car. I don't want to die. Keith says, I'm not. Sheila states, wait till I put her out. In discussing his plan to kill Brooklyn in the Home Depot parking lot, Keith tells his mother, but that's another thing. If she don't get out that car, mama, and I have to drag her out or can't, I'm going to ask you to step out because I'm going to open the door and just shoot her. As long as you don't shoot me, replies Sheila. She then adds, Hell, if you're getting off work now, I'll give you the address here and you can write over here and do it so you don't have to do it in front of your daughter. Keith agrees, responding, Send it to me. Sheila, seeming to understand the risky nature of the conversation, texts, Hold up, let me get it. Erase the text because I don't want nobody to know I was texting your stupid ass. Keith states, I already deleted mine. Trust me, I ain't going to say shit about us even talking today. At 11.32 a.m., Keith confirms to his mother that he is headed to Pensacola and asks for the address again. Sheila replies, I'm getting it. Give me a minute. I'm on lunch. At 11.43 a.m., Keith asks for the address a third time. And for the first time in the conversation, Sheila responds with some semblance of motherly wisdom while still promising to give him the information he needs to fulfill his morbid plan. Sheila states, You don't give a fuck about that baby. I'll get you the address when I get back. And you ain't showing nobody nothing except you got mental issues. Because you're willing to give up your life and your baby daughter's life and hurt your family over a But don't worry, I'll make sure she knows Brooklyn gave you something that you had to get a shot for, but that you didn't love her enough to give a fuck about what happened to her. That she wasn't enough for you. Finally, at 11.55 a.m., Sheila sends her son a screenshot of the address for the Home Depot on North Davis Highway in Pensacola. One of Keith's last messages to his mother reads, So that last thought of her, knowing she's f***, and the regret in her face will be enough to satisfy me. I don't give a f- what she sees when she's dead. The final text in the thread is sent by Sheila at 1242, stating, Okay then, stop texting me, I'm working. Do whatever. Less than one hour later, Brooklyn Sims was dead. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Jack Wilkin from Mr. Oh, Gee, and um, I'm uh, assisting Mr. Ravi. He's unavailable for today, so I'm covering her first appearance. Right. Presently, Your Honor, I believe she is before the court on a no bond on principle to premeditated uh, first degree murder. Yes. Would ask that uh, bond be addressed, Your Honor. All right, Mr. Murray. Yes, Your Honor, um, you've read the report. Uh, this was a warrant where the judge issuing the warrant issued no bond. She's not entitled to a bond. She's from Alabama. This is a capital offense. Uh, you have read the report. This is a serious offense with uh, significant evidence. It's a mandatory life sentence if she's convicted. It'll obviously be taken before a grand jury. We ask that in the meantime, it remains out of no bond. Yes, sir, Your Honor. Um, as far as the uh, the evidence is concerned, now, Mr. Mr. Myers is correct. This is a, a capital offense that was perpetrated, uh, allegedly perpetrated by her son, and she is a principal to uh, the alleged incident. Uh, the majority of the evidence that the court has reviewed is text messages that were taken out of context. And Your Honor, to my knowledge, she has over no prior criminal history that would support such a, a, such a charge, notwithstanding the fact that uh, the state had, is correct that she's not entitled as a matter of right for a bond. However, the first appearance judge can still issue a bond and would be asking for a $250,000 bond, cash or professional, Your Honor, with a monitor should the court um, require one, notwithstanding the fact that she is in uh, Alabama as her residence, she can be made to find lodging here in this jurisdiction, Your Honor. So again, we would be requesting a $250,000 cash professional bond and with the monitor 
and pretrial services to monitor her activities while she's in Scandia County. I think, sir, at this time, the bond will remain at no bond. You'll be ordered to have no contact with any witnesses in the case. Is it 8 September? Yes, sir. All right, ma'am, your next court date is 8 September, okay? On Monday, August 14th, Three days after the murder of Brooklyn Sims, the Escambia County Sheriff's Office concluded that Sheila Agee played a major role in the killing of Brooklyn Sims. Sheriff Chip Simmons stated, The murder itself is unbelievable, but to know the mother knew about it and helped coordinate it is incomprehensible. Consequently, Sheila Agee was arrested in Washington County, Alabama, and was extradited to Florida to face charges. She made her initial appearance remotely at the M.C. Blanchard Courthouse on August 17th, where the judge denied her request for bond. Sheila was charged with principal to first-degree premeditated murder. Under Florida law, a principal is a person who intentionally helps another person commit a crime, also known as an accomplice. As per Florida statute, a person does not have to be at the scene of the crime to be charged and convicted as a principal. Principal theory is a way for the state to hold accomplices criminally responsible for the actions of a partnership or group. Sheila Agee will be tried separately from her son, and her next court date is set for February 28, 2024. The trial of Florida v. Keith Agee commenced on December 19, 2023. Prosecutors entered the courtroom with confidence, bolstered by what they considered an overwhelming case for conviction. The evidence against A.G. was formidable. A confession, clear video evidence, testimonies from multiple eyewitnesses, and damning text messages. Given the strength of this evidence, it seemed the prosecution's presence in the courtroom was essentially a formality. On August 11, 2023, this defendant, Keith A.G., was on his own mission. And what the evidence will show and the state will prove is that his mission was to find, shoot, and kill Brooklyn Sims. You are going to hear that this defendant left his job in Alabama. He drove an hour and a half to two hours from Alabama to Pensacola to the Home Depot. He parked his car in the parking lot. He, drew, he walked to the front entrance of the Home Depot and he literally walked directly to the aisle where Brooklyn Sims was working at that time. He then fired at least seven shots from a nine millimeter handgun directly at Brooklyn Sims. At that point, he found her, he shot her, and he killed her. His mission accomplished. Agee's public defender had the unenviable task of arguing against the compelling evidence. I want to first thank y'all for bearing with us through the process yesterday. I know it gets repetitive and it took a lot of your time, so we appreciate you for being here today. I know, like the judge said yesterday, a jury summons isn't an invitation, but... We appreciate your service and we're asking you to pay attention today and render a fair and impartial verdict at the end of this trial. Now this is going to be a bit different type of case than uh, is normally tried in criminal court. And as far as that, I don't expect to contest a lot of the facts and the evidence that the state puts on. Um, you heard the government's attorney uh, tell you everything they anticipate showing to you. There's gonna be high resolution surveillance video from the Home Depot, scores of witnesses that are unbiased and impartial, um, cell phone tracking data. A lot of this stuff is not going to be in dispute. But at the end of this trial, I'm going to ask you to rent, as being fair and impartial, jurors selected to hear the facts of this case and ultimately reach a decision. I'm going to ask you to determine whether this was a cold, calculated, premeditated first degree murder as the states charged it, or was it something else? Was it something else? 
You just witnessed Agee's defense attorney state the question is not whether Keith Agee killed Brooklyn Sims, but whether Agee was in his proper state of mind. For example, was he so enraged that he was not in control of his mental capacity? A conviction on a reduced charge of second-degree murder would mean that the 20-year-old A.G. could still have some semblance of a life when his prison term is done. In the state of Florida, a conviction of first-degree murder is punishable by a sentence of life in prison without the possibility of parole and, in certain circumstances, the death penalty. In most murder trials, it is generally considered not a good idea for the accused to take the stand. But in this case, the decision was made that A.G. would testify in court in the hopes of persuading jury members to his diminished responsibility claim. Keith there, K G A G E E. How did the day begin? It started off as any other average morning. I got up for work early, got dressed, and started my day and proceeded to work. And did you have to work that day? Yes, sir. When the states introduced text messages between you and your mother. Is that correct? That was between you and your mother? Yes, sir. Did at some point that day you discover you had been diagnosed with uh, gonorrhea? Yes, sir. How did you find that out? I received the call from Greater Mobile Urgent Care. When had you, uh, when had you taken a, an SVD test? The following, the before Tuesday. To that date. Tuesday prior to the shooting? Yes, sir. Why did you have that test done? I started uh, experiencing abnorm abnormalities that I've never had while peeing and uh, resting and sitting down. Uh -huh. Had you ever had a sexually transmitted disease before? Never in my life. Other than the weekend, was that after? Immediately after the weekend you had spent with Brooklyn? Yes, sir. The following Tuesday I got a test. Had you been sexually active with anyone else? Not for almost two months with anybody else. <clears throat> after you were informed you had an STD, how did you feel? Enraged, betrayed, hurt. Through this testimony, the defense aimed to achieve several objectives. To present A.G. as a relatable individual, delve into and clarify his mental state at the time of the offense, and sway the jury by showing A.G.'s sense of remorse and acceptance of responsibility. Yet, it was crucial that A.G.'s demeanor, the consistency of his narrative, and his overall credibility hold up under the rigorous cross-examination by the prosecution, where every detail of his testimony would be meticulously scrutinized. We heard testimony earlier today that Calvert is two hours away, is that right? Um, for the average trip, it didn't take me two hours. How long did it take you? Um, anywhere close to around an hour and thirty. So an hour and a half. Or yes, sir. Did you stop anywhere along the way? Um, uh, I think I stopped to get gas along the way. Did you not stop in Loxley? Uh, I think that's one of the stores I stopped by. I can't recall. How many stops did you make? Only one. So why do you say one of the stores? You because I, I, can't, I can't approximately remember what store I stopped at along any of the exits. I don't, I don't, I'm not too familiar with any of the area going further around Loxley. 
anywhere past Mobile Bridge. Any idea how many exits are between Calvert and Home Depot? Any prop? I'd say about 20, maybe. You got the phone call that morning from your doctor saying that, that you tested positive for the gonorrhea, right? Yes, sir. And you said you were at work when that happened and you went straight home and that you heard that was your grandmother's house, right? Yes, sir. How far was that from your work? Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't take me two and a half minutes to leave my job and get to my house. And you said you weren't in the house but a, what, a minute and a half, you said? Yes, a minute and a half, yes, sir. How do you know it was a minute and a half? I remember leaving my car running, and I never, I never, my, from a park close to the house, and it's not 15 feet from the front, for, front porch to my, to my room and back, and I jogged in, jogged out. All right, you went straight to your room, you got your pistol. Yes, sir. That's the same pistol we saw earlier today. Yes, sir. Was your grandmother home? Uh, yes, sir. Did you talk to her? No, sir. You, you knew Brooklyn would be with your mother, but you didn't know where they'd be working, right? Yes, sir. And you got the address from your mother? Yes, sir. So when you got the phone call from your doctor, you automatically assumed Brooklyn gave it to you, right? Yes, sir. Your testimony is that you drove an hour and a half after getting your pistol. You got the address from your mother. You went straight to the Home Depot, right? Yes, sir. Didn't stop anywhere in Pensacola? No, sir. I didn't stop in Pensacola. No, sir. So you went straight to the Home Depot. You parked your car actually next to your mother's car, right? Yes, sir. Okay. You left your car and you went up to approach one because you saw the video earlier, right? Yes, sir. Okay, and you had your phone out? Yes, sir. What were you looking at? Uh, nothing. Nothing. My phone was just in my hand from being in the car. I, I had GPS on because I didn't know my way through Pensacola or how to get to Home Depot. When you were in the parking lot and in that store, did you not look down at your phone? I probably, I, I, I can't recall. Was your mother telling you where she was? No, sir, not in in the store. Did no. she drop a point to you? She, she told me on the way to Home Depot that they would be in Home Depot. Did she tell you what I? No, sir. Did she drop a point to you? No, sir. You enter the Home Depot in the main entrance and you walk directly to aisle 52, right? No, sir. I, I walked along the aisles looking. I didn't know which aisle exactly that she would be located on. You didn't stop and talk to anybody? No, sir. You went straight to her? Yes, sir. You walked down. Once you saw her, you walked down the aisle and you said you gave me something. Yes, sir. She says, in your words, not this again, and turned away from you. Yes, sir. You said on the ride over here, this hour and a half, you were... You were enraged, betrayed, felt hurt, right? Yes, sir. And you said you saw Brooklyn and it all melted away. Yes, for that brief moment, yes, sir. How long was this brief moment? Until she turned away from me and said, not again. And then you said again, you felt hurt, enraged, betrayed. The same thing you just said. Yes, sir. Never been so mad in your life. Yes, sir. Because she turned away from you. Yes, sir. You were going to teach her something. Yes, sir. In her closing arguments, Prosecutor Bridget Jensen asked the jury to weigh the evidence and recognize the gravity of the crime committed. Mr. Wise said the only question for you is, was this a cold, calculated, or premeditated murder? And you heard the evidence, and that's exactly what it is. 
He said, is this, was this something hot and fiery? Ladies and gentlemen, the only thing hot and fiery in this case was this defendant's premeditation as he fired those hot and fiery bullets into her body. Mr. Wise was talking about the small nick in the back of Ms. Thomas's back. Well, thank goodness, thank goodness that's the only injury she had. Because you heard the testimony, you've seen the evidence. Bullets are fl flying, fragments are flying, people are flying to get away from there. She told you she felt something and she went down. She was on that aisle, she was right there, dodging a bullet and only getting a graze. Thank goodness. You heard testimony from Dr. Oleski. She looked at the pictures, that injury is consistent with shrapnel. Let's get something real clear. This defendant had an STD. And this defendant assumed that he got it from Brooklyn Sims. But ladies and gentlemen, this is not about an STD. Does that make it okay? Absolutely not. This is not about an STD, this is about his pride. The STD is curable. Brooklyn Sims' murder is not. 29 holes he riddled into her body. Didn't cure his STD, but it cured his pride. The mom's involvement. Mr. Wise said she stoked this defendant's flames. And let me tell you something, those text messages are nothing less than despicable. You have them in evidence. They're despicable between both of them. But Sheila Agee is not on trial today. Keith Agee is. <coughs>